Hello, everybody. I'm Howie Hawkins, the Green Party candidate for governor. I'm here with my running mate for Lieutenant Governor Gia Lee. And we're live in Brooklyn. And, you know, when I was asked to run again, I said, well, I got to have a school teacher as a running mate like I had four years ago because Governor Cuomo has probably his worst policy area as education. He's underfunding the schools. He's imposed this high stakes testing, which is pseudoscientific. There's not really anything about education, but it does encourage privatization, expansion of charter schools, where these hedge fund guys can double their money in seven years. You know, you may have remember Juan Gonzalez wrote about that in the Daily News maybe eight years ago. And now if you look it up online, you'll find that in Investopedia, because of this new markets tax credit of 30 something percent every year on the loans they make to these charters. So that's a whole scam. And all those people are putting big money into Governor Cuomo. And then we have the most segregated schools in the nation by race and class. So we got a lot of problems with education. And uh, being a teamster and not a teacher, I needed a teacher who knows what's going on in the classroom in real life with these policies. And that's why we're running GIA for Lieutenant Governor. So Gia, maybe you wanna say a few words about you know, your views on the education issues in the state. Sure, hi everyone. I'm uh, actually really, really honored to be on this live stream to talk about this issue because I think it's what propelled me to become a very vocal and an activist, um, not just as a special education teacher in New York City, but as a parent um, of a child who has an IEP, an individualized education plan, um, and just wanting, like every other parent um, and teacher, for their students, for their children, to have a quality education. Um, around 2001 is when I started teaching in the New York City public school system. And that was the beginning of, as we, we all remember, No Child Left Behind Act under George Bush, um, George W. Bush. Um, quickly realized that under this system where we we're supposed supposedly supposed to um, eliminate illiteracy and make sure that all students were up to par and could read and write and, you know, do computation um, at 100%. Uh, we quickly realized that this was not a reality under the kind of system that we work, were working under. And just want to fast forward to 2009 when Bill Gates was invited to be the keynote speaker at the Democratic National Convention. And that is around the time when I had an aha moment. I realized then, um, and these were his words, he said while addressing the convention that he was really excited for this new opportunity because this new, these new standards, he was referring to the Common Core standards and the testing that will come along with it will increase uh, market profitability and improve teaching and learning in you know, the upwards of millions of dollars. So he was not talking about improving you know, teaching and learning for students. He was talking about the, the profit potential. I was shocked because there was there, you know, all of our elected officials from New York State, from across the country, applauding this endeavor. And at the state and the city level, we see how it's played out. We have all the Democrats, Republicans included, completely uh, being catered to by charter school lobbyists, real estate firms as well, hedge funds who are interested in the education industry. Uh, one of the biggest investors or campaign donation donors um, were from the education, these education organizations to increase the charter caps, to uh, push forward teacher accountability measures that's in the form of high stakes standardized testing, um, teacher accountability, uh, legislation. All of these pieces of policy were coming out of ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which I think people now know is notorious for developing privatization schemes. It's basically where you have private and public partnerships. Um, and so at the city level, we are under an immense amount of pressure because 
we live in a very competitive system. And if you don't know any better, you are grappling, you're, you're fighting to figure out the best way to get your child into the best public schools. And people are asking, you know, what can I do to get my child the upper leg, right? Sometimes that might mean uh, parents investing in test prep centers. There's been a record uh, increase in the profits in um, places like Kaplan uh, and other test prep sites and uh, tutoring centers, uh, Kumon. And then an increase in the number of students who want to apply for specialized high schools, gifted and talented programs, uh, all under the guise of school choice. Uh, this has been proven to be disastrous. We're not seeing the, the consequences of, of these kinds of uh, systems in place that are based on competition and, and schools as markets, uh, as businesses um, that need to sell their school. And, um, you know, I'm happy to take more questions and get really specific about all of that. But there is, you know, some really troubling statistics on the rate of school closures in predominantly black and brown communities, as well as uh, the really inadequate and unequal uh, funding that's happening and the fun way funding formulas work in the city and across the state. So I'm um, happy to take questions. Please send them forward so that we can start answering them. And I'm happy to talk about anything else if you have questions. Okay, I'm not sure how we're gonna get the questions up online uh, since we're doing this remote this time. Um, but I would just, you know, following up on what Gia just said, uh, this competitive system, why are we rationing quality education? There's a big controversy here in New York State about changing the way uh, people are admitted, students are admitted to the eight so-called specialized high schools. Well, in fact, there are like over 50 uh, schools, I think a third of the high schools in the city screen. So we got we're basically tracking people into different levels of education, segregating them. And then uh, of course, the children coming from the poorest backgrounds end up in the lowest tracks. They don't get a good education. 40% of the high schools in the city don't have college preparatory math and science courses. This is absurd. Uh, we know from, you know, one thing I learned in the course of this campaign, it's shocking to me, there are three and four year olds whose parents are paying thousands of dollars for test prep so they can test into gifted and talented uh, coursework. And apparently the coursework is no different than the other kids get there just a year advanced. Um, and, you know, what about late bloomers? What about 10% of the kids in the schools here in, in New York, also in my city of Syracuse, are homeless on any given day? You know, how do you, how do you test prep? What if you're in the lower track? And then what if your situation gets stabilized and you're a late bloomer? I mean, this system is so irrational. And then, of course, the funding. It's the high poverty schools that don't have enough money. And it's not just that we need to restore the funding that was promised with the Campaign for Fiscal Equity. We got to change the formula because even under the uh, formula, the high poverty schools are getting the short end of the stick. So there's a lot. Oh, look, oh you got the questions. Okay. Yeah. So I'm She's seeing, the teacher. She knows what's going on. I'm seeing uh, the questions coming in. What first? What I want to do is address a little bit and, um, you know, explain to folks how I got involved. At first, you know, yes, I was seeing how things were playing out. I quickly realized, along with a few of my colleagues and other parents, that the way that the standardized test scores were being used, uh, it was not being used the way that they were even, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, being used in a high stakes manner, what that did was no longer were they like criterion reference tests, you know, like your driver's license test, they were being placed on a statistical bell curve. And if people remember their statistics courses, you remember, you know, you have a top quartile, you have a big middle and then a bottom quartile. So what you're inevitably doing is creating a, an, a for sure failure set of failing, uh, failing schools and failing students and failing teachers. And that is all part of, you know, what we call like a lean production model, right? Squeeze the system and push out the worst. And that has had a disproportionate impact on poor black and brown communities. 
And in New York City, we see uh, the the schools that get slated for closure is labeled as failing, right? Um, labeled as needing a renewal or turnaround, all the different labels that have gone through the years. The parents get a letter indicating that there's something wrong with the school. Those students, you see a huge drop in enrollment, a huge drop in enrollment, and then that gives a rationale for the city, and I've seen this across the state in the you know big five cities um, where there are big pockets of you know poor uh, neighborhoods with schools that are completely underfunded um, being labeled and then close, being given a notice of closing because of under enrollment, but it was set up to be that way. And uh, there have been several organizations, uh, the Coalition for Educational Justice has issued uh, there, that's New York City based. Uh, the Advancement Project, these are all civil rights groups, have indicated uh, that the color of school closures is uh, predominantly, you know, that it's a civil rights issue. And just this last week, uh, the NAACP finally ruled that um, they are completely opposed to the use of high stakes standardized testing. So um, there's a question of, I'll just read it out loud. What do people not understand about how schools are funded and how that creates disparities between wealthy and poor communities? New York State, compared to other states, will come across looking as if we, ha we have a higher per people spending amount, right? But if you look across the state in different communities, there are huge disparities. So poor communities uh, in across state get less funding. We know that it's based on um, in the suburban communities and rural communities on your zip code, it's, you know, in your property taxes. Uh, in New York City, it works a little differently. And what we're finding is through the campaign for fiscal equity, you know, public schools are owed around $4.2 billion. The court, the highest court ruled uh, that the state must pay up. It's been 10 years, I think over 10 years now. They still have not paid public schools their funding, but in this time have increased accountability measures. And that's completely um, done on purpose because they are on a fast track to shutter schools, to increase privatization measures. And there's a complete connection to the gentrification that's also happening. I think a lot of folks have caught on to that. Um, but let's say in the Bronx, there's per people spending at a renewal school of $17,000 and people will say, that's a lot of money. But if you look at the numbers and people have done FOILs, you know, files for in public information um, to find out how that money is being spent, a large percentage of that money is going to outside private consultants that have been contracted through the Department of Education. That funding is not going directly into the schools and that's why you see crumbling infrastructures. Um, you know, and there's zero engagement with the community. I'll tell you right now, a big red flag for, for us should be when decisions are made from top down without engaging the communities. And if we really want to change things, and I think this is where I completely am, uh, you know, in alignment with the Green Party, and the reason why I'm running with the Green Party is because that we need to call for a different vision. We have to stop speaking in the terms of the privatizers. We have to start talking about, so what is our vision for the kind of public education in a democratic society that you know we wanna see? What are the things that we need? What are the problems? Let's do the analysis and then figure out the solutions. All we know is the privatizers are, are marketing and taking advantage of a problem There's, because of systemic inequity and coming up with solutions that will only are tied to benefit them through profit. So um, I hope that people dig a little deeper in looking at their own school community, school budgets and seeing how money is being allocated. That'll give you a really big indicator and in how decisions are being made. I'll do, we'll do another question. Can you talk about the wildcat teachers strikes? Yes, I can, across the country, why they've been successful and what teacher unions are facing now after the Janus Supreme Court ruling. So um, I'm really honored to be a, a member of the Movement of Rank and File Educators. That's a caucus within the United Federation of Teachers, uh, the largest local in New York State. 
um, and representing a large number of educators across the country. And we're in what we call a blue state, predominantly Democrat. And so we're not seeing this phenomenon happening in any blue states. We are seeing this these wildcat strikes happening in red states. Not to distinguish the two, it's like if you're in a blue state, we're on a slow burner, I call it. We're like lobsters boiling. Whereas in a red state, they're on a fast track on this privatization. Um, the kinds of cuts that have been made on schools that have caused teachers to have to work two, sometimes three different jobs just to be able to survive. Not only that, these same uh, Republican governors that they put into, some of these teachers help put into the into office, they, they're realizing are also, you know, underfunding or cutting and privatizing healthcare. Uh, so there have, there are actually, they've actually been able to connect with their community members and parents because they're, all of these cuts are happening and austerity measures and austerity measures are happening at such a rapid pace that people are coming together and realizing they need to be, you know, they need to be together in solidarity. The wildcat teacher strikes were not just the teachers. You saw bus drivers coming out. You saw healthcare um, providers, unionized healthcare providers, also coming out in support. Um, administrative, the administrators union also supported the strikes, um, and they were in such dire straits that they had no choice. It was to the point where in West Virginia, the union leadership went to the negotiating table and said, okay, we'll take your, you know, whatever, three, two, three percent. And the rank and file, which had organized and propelled the union to strike, basically said, back to the table, we're the union, and forced their union leadership back to um, the table to negotiate back up to the five percent, and they won. Um, there were other measures that they won as well. And I think what it's going to, I hope what it's, for us in, in New York, I think that there's been too many negotiations between our union leaders and um, Democrats and Republicans, uh, re representatives behind closed doors. And so they negotiated out after the Janus, in preparation of the, of the Janus ruling for, you know, things like, oh, uh, there, you know, certain entities cannot obtain union members' private confidential information to be able to send us, you know, whatever, you know, uh, media, I don't know, information about how to get other services, because, you know, that's the primary uh, impetus behind some of the unions is like, don't, you know, don't forget about your benefits. Um, and there's a lot of literature coming out from the very people who funded the Janus case um, to also get encourage mem members to, to decertify from their union. And so that's one of the, the things. And also um, negotiated with, you know, our governor, Cuomo, to create a shorter period for, you know, um, de-enrollment or, you know, it's taking to stop paying dues. Um, to decertify from the union that we have a really short window right now. Um, and so, you know, these negoti negotiations happen behind closed doors. We don't have a sense of real uh, rank and file movement. Uh, people have been, you know, comfortable. And I will say New York State does, is successful. The unions here have been successful in terms of making sure that members feel like they, they have good benefits, um, that there's some sense of representation. But really the bigger picture is if we really want to build a rank and file uh, working class empowerment and not live under increasing austerity measures, we have to realize our collective power. Let's see, there are more questions. Wow, there are a lot. Um, do church schools get tax money? From what I understand, and I don't know too much about this, um, I've been at New York City. In New York City, we have what are called panel for educational policy hearings uh, once a month. And I have seen some parochial schools come out um, fighting for, you know, equity. And it's interesting to me because some of these uh, church schools, Catholic schools, um, the, you know, 
the Jewish community has their schools. I, do, I believe they get some funding to um, promote certain parts of their standards, but I don't know to, to what extent. Well, that, that was an issue last time. And uh, at that time, 2014, Governor Cuomo was for tuition tax credits for religious schools. It didn't pass. And I think he's dropped it. So it's not a pending issue. Um, the thing about religious schools, the yeshivas, is they've been able to uh, not be regulated to meet minimum state standards. That's what Simka Felder was fighting for. So you hear these people who are dissidents within the Orthodox community coming out and saying, we're illiterate because we've been, you know, just memorizing the religious texts and not really learning how to read which uh, they argue their leaders want them to be illiterate, so they're not smart and can't criticize the leaders. Um, so there's an issue right there, but it doesn't have to do with the tax money. It's up, up there in Curious Joel where they've actually got control of a school district, and that's a whole nother uh, can of worms. But as far as the state giving tax credits for tuition to religious schools at this point, as far as I know, it does not happen. Monique says, all kids are gifted and talented. As a public school special education teacher, I, I completely agree with you. Um, can I share with you guys a real quick snippet? I've been saving this for this, uh, for this podcast, for this live stream. So this was a, a report that I will try to share the link out if I can find it. Um, Prefiguring Our Contemporary Dilemmas, there was a 1938 report in the early NEA, which is the National Education Association, quote, most of the standardized testing instruments and written information used in schools today deal largely with information. There should be a much greater concern with the development of attitudes, interests, ideals, and habits. To focus tests exclusively on the acquisition and retention of information may recognize objectives of education sorry, um, which are relatively unimportant. So this was in 1938 and they're saying all these tests that we've been administering kids in the public school system, they focus on information that's relatively unimportant. And what they are, what they did find, and this was a very comprehensive report, um, measuring the results of education must be increasingly concerned with such questions as these, and I hope you guys will nod along with me. Are the children growing in their ability to work together for a common end? Do they show greater skill in collecting and weighing evidence? Are they learning to be fair and tolerant in situations where conflicts arise? Are they sympathetic in the pressure of suffering and indignant in the presence of injustice? Do they show greater concern about questions of civic, social, and economic importance? Are they using their spending money wisely? This was during the Great Depression. Are they becoming more skillful in doing some useful type of work? Are they more honest, more reliable, more temperate, more humane? Are they finding happiness in their present family life? Are they living in accordance with the rules of health? Are they acquiring skills and using all the fundamental tools of learning? Are they curious about the natural world around them? Do they appreciate each to the fullest degree possible, their rich inheritance in art, literature, and music? Do they balk at being led around by their prejudices? This was in 1938. I think we were on the right track there. Um, I think what we saw was this is, that was pre-Brown versus Board of Ed. Um, as soon as schools became, you know, supposedly desegregated, we're finding um, greater policy, increase in policies that I would argue are parts of systemic inequity to perpetuate in institutionalized racism. And so, yes, I agree that all uh, students are gifted and talented and that as educators, as parents, that we believe in those values, those quotes about the goals of education. The goals of education should be about how to develop a generation who, who care about the common good. Um, Wilton says, due to offshoring and automation, capitalism has less need for an educated workforce, hence the planned and ongoing destruction of public education. Yes, um, this is true. And in, in a digitized world, there's uh, actually the fastest growing industry is in education and you wouldn't believe what it's in. It's in ed tech um, and artificial intelligence. There is uh, less reliance and need for a workforce. Um, and I don't wanna get into you know, 
conspiracy theories here, but um, I think people are feeling the, the crunch with um, fewer jobs, uh, less access to quality education, and really are we gonna let the 1% determine the industry of the future or are we as a collective gonna determine the kind of future we want? And then we have to decide what the schools would look like and what they'll sound like. And honestly, um, I think our environment should be priority number one and that our students have to be prepared to problem solve, um, you know, to tackle these problems that we've created. Yeah, I would just add that uh, it's not just that they don't need educated people because, you know, digitized software as well as the old uh, machines that have become more automated don't need as much skill from the workers. Because people are being the fastest growing jobs, like nine out of the 10 fastest categories, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics projections, are things like servers, home health aides, things you don't even need a high school education for. And they're low wage jobs and capitalism or capitalists don't want an educated workforce that knows how to fight back. So I think part of the reason that the segregation and uh, rationing out of good education is going on now is because they want us to be dumb and not be able to figure out what they're doing to us. And that's why a good education is subversive to the powers that be. So I think it's, it's worse than they don't need us. They don't want us to be smart. Next question. Donnie asks, what will you be able to do about the corruption in Albany? There are several questions, so maybe we'll start with that one. Howie, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, the corruption. How you, will you deal with the IDC, the Independent uh, Democratic Conference, for example? How are you all relating to other parts of New York and to unions outside the teachers' unions? Well, I'm a teamster. We got six teachers' union locals to endorse this last time. I don't know if we're going to do it this time because Cuomo kind of tossed bones to all the public employee unions. And, you know, they're, I think, running scared. It's like they, they'd rather deal with the devil they know, Cuomo, than the devil they're worried about, which is the Republican. So they've sort of uh, accepted that Cuomo is the devil they know. Uh, we wanted, our slogan in our campaign is to demand more. And first of all, you know, we got to demand clean government. We got to get the crooks out from Donald Trump and Andrew Cuomo to all these legislators that are parading off to prison right now. And we know there's more behind there. So we're calling for a, a re-empaneling of a Moreland Commission on Public Corruption and let it go through its whole process rather than have Cuomo shut it down as soon as they get close to him. We need full public campaign financing, not this matching funds thing like they do in New York City where they sprinkle a little public money on top of the old pile of private money sort of, you know, rich people still dominate full public campaign financing on a clean money model where everybody who opts in gets an equal public grant sufficient to reach uh, the voters and uh, it's a level playing field. Plus, uh, when you opt into the system, you should have access to the public access and uh, publicly supported TV and radio stations, NPR and PBS, uh, to get your message out and to have debates on there. Um, so that's, I guess that covers it. Corruption, how we relate to the other unions, Independent Democratic Conference is now uh, formally dead, uh, but they're Democrats and they work cooperating with the Republicans. I mean, I, I would argue that the whole two party system is corrupt. Pay to play is in both parties. Pay to play is causing for graft, corruption, bribes, shakedowns. You know, politicians from both parties are going to prison here in New York. Uh, there's over 40 of them driven out of state office since 19, since 2000. And, you know, I suspect there's a lot more out there. So we need we need to clean up Albany and it's got to go outside a two party system. That's why the Greens are independent and opposed to both major parties. And I would even say I, I think it would be this is a good opportunity um, to have a discussion about the structure and, and how, you know, business as usual is not working um, in our state government and in a lot of cases in our local government. And what do people think? would be the best way to be open and transparent. Um, as Lieutenant Governor, you know, that position that presides over the state legislature, you know, the, the job is to help advance certain, you know, policies and certain pieces of key legislation that would help the lives of everyone in the state. And so I believe that part of that is examining the whole process and making it more transparent 
um, uncovering some of the behind closed door, you know, dealings um, and making it so that it can't happen. The next question, somebody says, thanks for bringing the uh, excellent point on the abysmal segregation. Yes. And the next question is, uh, how do we reconcile the need for local control over schools with the needs for integrated schools? In other words, what takes priority? Spending more money on underperforming neighborhood schools or diversifying populations at all schools. And then it says parenthetically talking New York City urban schools primarily, but this is a statewide issue. So why don't you talk about the city and I can talk about upstate sure. in terms of how we desegregate. Okay. I think this is, uh, that's a good question, but it's not an either or situation. And I can tell you from my experience firsthand um, in lower Manhattan, where I teach, we are actively taking on um, diversification initiatives. And what we're finding is that there's a, not to be con confused with school choice movement, which is actually been disastrous for us, there was another initiative that was created a few decades ago to combat the segregation that was happening in the Deep South called Controlled Choice. And what that does is it looks at uh, the number of students you know, down different factors, such as students with special needs, um, students who are English language learners, uh, those who qualify for free and reduced lunch, you name it, race, it goes down all these different factors. And then what you do is you try to create equitable distribution across the schools in a district. Um, the funding formula in New York City, and I only speak to New York City, what we have is called the Fair Student Funding Formula that was imposed by, you know, under Bloomberg, Joel Klein's chancellorship. And if you all know who Joel Klein is, you know, he's a businessman. He was not uh, somebody experienced in a school system, what he did was he created the fair student funding formula that's based on stack ranking, um, lean production model. We used to, prior to that, have the average, you know, based on the average teacher salary, because we respected a, a contract with teachers who were, you know, were compensated for their experience and were able to go up in salary as their years progress or education, you know, acquirement. So there was an, a school's got an allocated budget for the average teacher salary. Then they got a separate allocation for their operational costs. When Klein came in, he got rid of that formula altogether and created per pupil. So it's, you know, I don't know, um, let's say it's $8,000 per student. And then if a student has an IEP, it's 1.5. That formula does not take into account teachers with experience being in the building. And so what do we see? We see uh, veteran teachers being targeted in schools. What is the, one of the main factors in, in um, supporting student outcomes in schools? Teacher experience. The other factor is class size, but we're messing with both of those in the system. And what we're finding is, you know, the funding formula is problematic. People need to understand how that works and different formulas that achieve a certain purpose depending on what your intentions are. Um, I think we need to go back to that old formula. I think communities need to be aware of how that works. It's their right. Um, and the, the, the notion of underperforming. So the American Statistical Association, and uh, there's another organization that deals with psychometrics and standardized testing, wrote an open letter to the Obama administration when high stakes testing first started saying these standardized metrics were never designed and can never measure uh, how well schools are doing. In fact, they're greater indicators on the whole of parent educational attainment and um, the socioeconomic status. In school factors account between one and 14% of the overall factors and that's teacher experience, um, and class size, I referenced earlier. But the overall most, you know, the largest factors that play into attainment with that. And honestly, so the term underfunding feeds into the failure, school failure rhetoric, and we have to change that. We really have to change that. Well, in terms of upstate, if we're gonna have uh, desegregation using a controlled choice model, where families rank the schools they wanna go to, 
and then you uh, use that in a formula along with making sure you have schools that are balanced by economic class, which is what the courts will permit now. Can't do it by ethnicity, but you get racial integration when you mix by class because the class structure, you know, a lot of people of color at the bottom, a lot of white people at the top, you mix up the classes, you mix up the races. Um, and so these district lines in cities like my city of Syracuse, which I'll use an example, are really the new Jim Crow lines because people who can afford to move into the affluent areas and they have more funding for their schools and they have, uh, you know, families from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. So uh, that's where the white people and the middle class people are going. And then the working class people and the people of color are in the city schools. Um, and in Syracuse, we are the most segregated city in the nation by the indicator of concentrated poverty. We have the most concentrated poverty for blacks and Latinos of any city in the nation out of like 200 above 50,000. Uh, and the fifth most for whites, which means it's a class issue as well as a race issue. And then you look at the Syracuse City School District and school districts directly adjacent and the disparity in the property tax base and funding going to the schools between the city of Syracuse and these suburbs is as great as any disparities in the country, like between Detroit and what's that county, Gross Point, or uh, what's that county? Anyway, the county next to uh, um, Detroit. So that's the situation in Syracuse. Now, back in 1965, Martin Luther King gave a speech at Syracuse University about segregation up north. And he was saying, you know, we're, we're getting rid of Jim Crow segregation in the south, but segregation is growing in the north. And if we don't do something about it, we're going to have the kind of situation we got now in Syracuse with the most segregated city in the country. So he said, going back to the question of funding versus desegregation, he said, we got to do both. Right now, the poor schools need money right now because we can't let those kids go unattended to while we go through a longer term process of desegregating. And then uh, here we are in uh, 2015 from 65, over 50 years later, there's a book came out by a professor up there at Syracuse University in the education department called Hope and Despair in the American City. And it compared Raleigh, uh, North Carolina and Wake County with Syracuse. And in Wake County, they desegregated by a controlled choice program like I just described. And the poor kids did a lot better, the middle-class kids did as well. And they did much better on all the kind of indicators that Gia was talking about in the 1938 uh, piece from the National Education Association. You know, those qualities of teamwork and creativity and problem solving and tolerance. And uh, the subtitle of that book was Why There Are No Bad Schools in Raleigh. And the rest of the subtitle, because then he described Syracuse, is why all the schools in Syracuse are bad. And the reason is they're segregated. And so to just sum up what we got to do upstate is we got to create incentives for these school districts to consolidate across the race and class lines. Then you got a population you can integrate by a control choice program. All right. We're going to answer the last question, then we're going to close out. It's from <clears throat> Annabaum. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. My biggest concern is housing issues. Rent is skyrocketing, and tenants have little voice in civil court versus landlords and few protections for renters. How do we connect the fights for housing justice and education justice? Uh, those are two things are completely interrelated, if you, and also related to unions. Um, in New York City, the first cooperatives were created by the unions um, in the early 1930s. And then um, what we're seeing is up in Albany, uh, over time, you know, rent stabilization laws, you know, the measures to protect affordable housing have changed. It's a joke. It's a complete farce. Um, the process for filing complaint against the landlord. In fact, the landlord has more rights, it seems, than the tenants. Um, and the courts seem to always be in favor of the landlords. But people are organizing. And I think that the changing demographics in the big urban pockets where the rents are really skyrocketing um, because there's a push out. And by the way, those are the same areas where there's high love, um, rates of school closures and tartarization. Um, we're finding that you know there's a plan for these urban 
areas. If you lay over gentrification um, pockets in the Bronx, and the same goes for Brooklyn and uh, school closures, there's there's almost a an equal like complete layover in the same spots. So um, I you know invite folks to to do that research in your community as well, and I think that measures have to be put into place to hold slum landlords accountable. Like down in Chinatown here in New York City, a landlord was taken to court and found guilty and ha now has to pay up um, to each tenant for harassment, $25,000. I think that really set a precedent and uh, gave notice to all of the other landlords who were uh, harassing and creating really unlivable situations for families. Well, I, you know, in answer to that last question, how do we connect the fights for housing justice and education justice? They're both fights against segregation and inequality and the exclusion of whole bunches of people from real opportunities and resources. So in terms of the housing courts, we're calling for, uh, there should be publicly provided uh, lawyers for tenants when they go to court, if they can't afford their own. And that should be like a legal services thing that the state provides. We've got to have rent control authority statewide. And in New York City, we got to close all these loopholes by which the landlords are getting units deregulated. And then when they break the law, force some people out, we got to crack down on them, which is not happening. And then, you know, the big problem is there are not enough affordable housing units. So we got to not just fix up NYCHA, which is $25 billion right there. We got to expand public housing because that's the cheapest way to build affordable units. Right now, the subsidies to developers to build so-called inclusive, what are they called, inclusionary zoning, you have to earn $50,000 a year to even qualify to be included. And, uh, you know, it, that's uh, not what people making low wages can afford. So a lot of people are excluded, even when it's called inclusionary. So we need public housing that's mixed income, like they do in Europe. You have professionals, middle class people, teachers, lawyers, as well as working class folks and poor folks, all in the same developments. And they're not like these high rises that segregated poor and minority people and isolated them from opportunities. Uh, so mixed income, scatter site, human scale, powered by clean energy. And this would not just be a, a program for affordable housing and clean energy and desegregation. It would be a great jobs program. So those are the things. And then as we desegregate the housing, it's easier to desegregate the schools because you're not traveling such distances to get that balance in the schools. So. Uh, last thing we'd like to do, and I, I've enjoyed this, so I'd like to keep going, but I know we can't be too long on here, is uh, we need help on this campaign. Uh, there's more information on the website. It's www.howiehawkins.org. You can read a lot more about what we're talking about. You can volunteer. You fill out a volunteer form. We'll get back in touch with you, and you can help with the campaign. And, of course, you know, we're like the poor people's campaign. We're the lowest budgeted, but we make more we, we get more bang for our buck out of every dollar we get because we have a lot of volunteers and the few staff we have are coordinating them. So we need donations so we can uh, keep this little uh, ship going. We're like a small business, you know, up against Amazon and Walmart. But uh, I think we're getting our licks in and we're making progress. So I hope you'll help us out. And thanks for watching. Bye.